So this lecture starts our new topic, which is the photoelectric effect and radiation. Um, this particular lecture will focus on the photoelectric effect. We will have another one or two about radiation. Um, this topic is going to bring in some new material, obviously, and it's also going to work on some of the things you already know. Um, the model of an atom is something that you should know, um, and, and we'll be talking about that. And then what we learned with waves, we'll tap into this, and then we bring in some new stuff. So this is going to really incorporate a few different things. Um, <clears throat> for starters, though, we really want to look at some of the basic um, terms for electricity. Now, we'll get into these in much more detail when we do the topics about electricity. But, um, but for now, we do need to know some of the basics, right? Um, at the beginning of the year, we started with some fundamental um, units, right? Some units that can't be broken down into anything else, right? So mass was one. Mass is measured in kilograms. Uh, length is another measured in meters and time in seconds. Now, the units, kilograms, meters, and seconds, yeah, there's other units we could use to measure those, but we can't break it down into some other smaller component, right? Like force is measured in newtons, and a newton can be broke down to a kilogram meter per second squared, right? We can't break down a kilogram, we can't break down a meter, we can't break down a second. Those are our fundamental units. Um, way back when, at the beginning of the year, we had one more fundamental unit, which was charge, right? And charge is the last fundamental unit, and we really can't break it up into other things, right? Um, a charge is simply a charge. Um, and there's different ways to define it. Um, and this definition I like a lot, especially when we talk more about electricity and we kind of step away from this topic, but I still think it works, right? So I like to define charge as the excess or shortage of electrons, right? If we look at the model of an atom, and, and you see this in chemistry, if we look at the model of an atom, if the atom has lost some electrons, well, then it's positively charged because there's more protons and electrons in that atom. On the flip side, if that atom has gained an electron or two and now it has more electrons than protons, well, now it's negatively charged, right? So that tends to be how we look at this. Um, but with that said, <clears throat> most of the time we're talking about charge, you know, kind of in the real world, we're usually talking about electrons, right? Because electricity is based on electrons. And a lot of other, you know, you know, bonding and chemistry is based on moving electrons around. So we tend to talk about electrons um, because they're the things in the atom that we can move around. Very hard to add a proton to a nucleus of an atom or to remove a proton, right? It's, it's, it's actually, it's not impossible, but it's pretty close to impossible. But it's easy to move electrons around, right? We could add electrons to an atom. We could take them away. That's not a big deal. So usually when we're talking about electricity, and moving around charges. We're really talking about moving around electrons. Um, with that said, um, electrons have a charge, which is an important number to keep track of, about 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And an electron is negatively charged, so it's negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. A proton has a charge of the same thing, except it's positive, positive 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, these are numbers that obviously you'd be given on a test, but you need to know them um, because lots of times we're not talking about an electron in a measurement. We're talking about groups of electrons. So we really should understand how many electrons make up something. Um, I've already said this, electrons are what tends to be moving around. Um, but with that said, we tend to not have a negative uh, values for electricity, even though we know that it's, um, that it's electrons that are moving. For example, um, <clears throat> If we understand what charge is, well, then current is when we get charges moving in one direction, right? If we have a bunch of electrons moving through a wire, for example, then it's not the question of how many electrons are moving, because that's not really the important. It's how many are flowing by me per second, right? So current is the measure of the flow of charges. And current is measured in amperes or amps, where one amp is one coulomb per second. And one amp's not an abnormal amount of current, right? When you start your car in the morning, you probably have eight or nine amps flowing out of the battery. If uh, if you had a bigger vehicle or if you started in the winter, you probably have like 10 times that flowing out of the battery. Um, the lights above you in the classrooms or in, even in your house tend to have about one amp flowing through it. So <clears throat> an amp's not an abnormal amount. Um, with that said, if we look at the bottom part, well, if we had one amp of electricity flowing or one amp 
is you know one coulomb of charge flowing per second. Well, then what does that really mean? Well, it really means that we have this many number of electrons flowing by every second. And we need to usually just understand that. We're not going to calculate it by electrons, but we need to understand when we start talking about current flow, we say, okay, I have 0.5 amps flowing by. Well, guess what? It's half of this number of electrons flowing by. I got one amp flowing by. It's this many electrons. So we use numbers like amps because they're just the right size, right? They're, they're, they're in the range that we're talking about. And we don't want to measure things, you know, 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons flowing by, right? So it's easier to say it's one amp. Um, but that's what it means, right? It means that there's a whole bunch of electrons going by every single second. <clears throat> and the other thing is too, I know I keep saying it, but there are electrons going by and electrons have a negative charge, but we're never gonna list it as negative amps, right? So, you know, in your home, if you say, well, there's a 10 amp fuse and it blew, well, it wasn't positive charges flowing through it, it was electrons, right? And even though they're negatively charged, we still call it a positive flow because electrons are the only things that flow. <clears throat> the other term, and we need to understand this, but we're gonna get into this one in, in so much more detail um, when we talk about you know, electricity specifically. Voltage is a kind of a complex topic that needs some time to get hashed out, kind of like acceleration first half. Even though we keep thinking we understand it, we just get more and more situations and it kind of gets confusing. Um, voltage is like that too. So there's, there's some work that will have to be done to really fully grasp this. But voltage is the change in potential energy per charge between two points. There's a lot there. One is there's potential energy that's given to charges and really we're comparing two places, right? Does it have more energy? Does it have less energy? Um, voltage is measured in volts. And if it's energy per charge, well, energy is measured in joules, charge is measured in coulombs. So a volt is the same as a joule per coulomb. So using this example, right? A nine volt battery means that every coulomb of charge will lose nine joules of energy as it travels from one side of the battery to the other. So if we think about it, right? We have a battery. And, and nine, we'll stick with a nine volt battery, the same thing that I wrote then, and we hook it up to a circuit. Well, one side of the battery is where the electrons are gonna come out and they're gonna make a full path and they're gonna re-enter the other side. So if it's a nine volt battery, that's basically saying when the charges leave, they're giving nine joules of energy or for a coulomb of charge, which again, when we have 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons leave, those collectively are given nine joules of energy. And by the time they come back to the other side of the battery, they will have given that nine joules of energy away to whatever's in the path, right? It's a light bulb, it's a speaker, it's a, it's a computer, whatever it is, something else is gonna get that, right? So every cool of a charge that leaves the battery will drop off nine joules of energy somewhere before it returns, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So it's the change in potential energy per charge between two points. So that's definitely what we're saying is true. Um, and we could use batteries in a couple different ways. Um, so just understanding the main component of this hopefully will work for us. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this more. Um, but voltage, the change of potential energy per charge between two points. So we need to understand these to talk about the photoelectric effect. Um, Cause the photoelectric effect was an important discovery that kind of opened the doorway to new types of science. Um, in 1887, it was discovered that shining light on metal plates will cause electrons to break free, right? So just by taking specific types of light and shining it on various surfaces, you could actually cause light electrons that are orbiting the atoms that, you know, are attached to that metal or part of that metal, causes those electrons to break free and then move away from that metal surface. If you hook up a circuit correctly, if you hook up something to it, then all of a sudden you can figure out how many electrons are breaking free. So if I look at something, let's see if I could do it. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Now, obviously it's a simulation, but we have this light. It is shining on a sodium surface and we could see the electrons breaking free, but also we've made a path for them to go. If it was just a metal surface, these electrons would be going all over the place. But over here we put, um, we put a plate that attracts the electrons to that break free. Right, so they break free and they have somewhere to go. So basically all the electrons are gonna go this way and then we could figure out how many electrons are flowing. In this you know, setup that I have, there's 1.244 amps flowing, which again, if we went back and did the math, it'd be an even bigger number, right? It would be a little more than, oops, where is it? There it is, 
a little more than 6.24, it would be about 7 or 8 times 10 to the 18 electrons flowing by per second, right? So when we measure the current flow, we know how many are flowing by per second, so we know how many electrons are leaving the metal surface per second, right? Which becomes very, very important. Um, so this is kind of a quick look at the photoelectric effect and how we could set it up so that we could measure how many electrons are breaking free. Um, and it becomes very important. There we go. Um, it becomes very important because now it allows us to study light. We have this situation where light has an effect and we could directly measure its effect on metal, right? We've seen other things with light, but this is one that we could really put some numerical values to it. And at this point, most people felt light was a wave because it does all the things that we've learned about. It refracts, it reflects, it defracts, there's interference. There's all these things we talked about and light does them all. And we witnessed light doing them all in class. So we know light acts like a wave. But there's some people that disagree with that because when they try and measure like light intensity or when they talk about how your eyes work, well, those don't really work like you would think they would work if light was a wave, right? They kind of assume that light's a particle and, and you know, little particles smash into the back of your eyeball or they smash into a light detector. Um, and with that in mind, some people say, well, I don't really know if light's a wave because when I try and measure light and, and when we use light, we're not using it in, in the same sense. So it kind of opened the door to some various experiments. <clears throat> so here was the general consensus, right? They set up an experiment and here's the experiment, um, same as what I've just shown. So I'm just gonna kind of change it around some, right? So this is kind of what we're looking at, but it was done in a very specific way. They didn't just shine light on it. They did many, they, they changed things and they looked at um, what happens to the electrons that are breaking free in various situations. And it was generally thought, if light is a wave, then the intensity is the driving factor, which means if I take this light, and right now it's at 100%, if I turn it down, I should just get less current flow, which works out just fine. So far, this supports the idea that light's a wave, right? Higher intensity just means there's more waves, or, or to say it differently, it says that it's waves at a higher amplitude, right? Higher amplitude, more energy, more electrons break free, right? So that makes sense to a lot of people that feel that light's a wave. Um, and let's go ahead and run this. What we start to see in this experiment, oh, sorry. What we start to see in this experiment, I'm gonna even make it bigger if I can, is that right now, everything holds true, this works out just fine. We take the light, it's at a certain wavelength, we turn up the intensity, as we turn up the intensity, we could see the current going up and down, right? And then we try it at a different wavelength, so it's a different color light, same thing happens. We turn it on a little bit, current comes out, and as we raise the intensity, more and more electrons break free. So again, light could certainly be a wave, right? The problem starts to happen when you get to higher wavelengths, like where we are, are at now, 502 nanometers, well, we're still seeing the effects, but the intensity isn't changing it too much. We see a few more coming out, but, but not much, much more, but there's still more. Um, now we go a little higher in wavelength, we raise the intensity, and now we start to see a problem, right? Right now, there's some type of issue because it doesn't matter what the intensity is, we can't get any electrons to break free. And it doesn't matter, right? As we go through the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, um, it doesn't matter what wavelength we pick. We simply can't break any electrons free. And this is important, right? As we go back down to the lower wavelengths, all of a sudden they start to break free again. And here is where we first see there's some type of issue with this wave model or this idea that lights a wave. So the photoelectric effect is proof that light does not always act like a wave because the intensity or the amplitude of the waves um, weren't really have an effect on how many electrons we break free, right? So the general theory came out that maybe light isn't a wave. Maybe it's made up of particles, and these particles we're calling photons, right? And instead of light being this wave of energy that's coming out of a light bulb, it is many, many billions and billions of small pieces, right? small particles, which we call photons, right? And our definition of photons are packets of energy because their mass is so small, we really can't even see how, you know, how much mass it has, right? So these, these little packets of energy that are coming out of the light. 
And this makes sense to this overall theory of the photoelectric effect, because if I shine light on it and there's millions and millions and millions of packets of energy, well, the only time they break an electron free is when one photon hits one electron, right? And it breaks it free. Um, and if I turn the intensity up, well, then more photons will hit more electrons, but still, it's still a one-to-one -one collision, right? Still one photon hit in one electron. And either that photon has enough energy or it doesn't. The fact that there's more photons doesn't really factor into this because they're just going to hit more electrons at the same time. Um, as we get up into higher wavelengths, right, we start to see that less of these collisions occur. And I'm going to kind of see if I can jump this forward. There we go. As we get into certain wavelengths, like like where we're at now, 574 nanometers, it doesn't really matter. Sure, we're releasing more and more photons, but these one-to-one -one collisions aren't great enough to knock the electrons free. The collisions are happening, but when one photon hits one electron, it doesn't knock it free. It's simply not strong enough. So we start to get into this idea that different wavelengths of light um, equate to different energy levels of photons. Now, some of this brings up questions because we're going to call a photon a packet of energy, but we're going to calculate how much energy it has, assuming it's a wave, right? We're going to base it on its frequency or base it on its wavelength. So this concept, which holds true today, that photons are released from light and photons are these packets of energy, um, works into this. Different frequencies of light have photons of different energy amounts, right? Which is what we just witnessed, right? The uh, indigos and violets um, were able to release electrons, therefore they must have more energy. And then the oranges and the reds were not able to release electrons, therefore they just didn't have enough energy. Um, which brings us to this, different frequencies of light have photons of different energy amounts, which gives us our first equation, which is the energy of the photon equals h, which is Planck's constant, Planck's constant, which is down here, times the frequency of the light. Or we know the speed of light equals frequency times wavelength. So if we use that equation and substitute it in, we can say the energy of the photon equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength, right? So we could calculate the energy of the photon. Now, the intensity determines how many photons are getting released. The frequency of the wavelength tells us how much energy they have. And Again, we're still kind of in this, this uh, weird situation where we're saying, hey, light's not a wave. It's made up of a bunch of photons. But if we're going to calculate the energy of photons, we kind of have to assume it's a wave because the equation is based on based on its wave properties, right? So, so this duality is still here, even in this equation, which is really the fundamental part of the photoelectric effect is this equation. So this idea that waves give off photons, packets of energies becomes very important and it holds true in a lot of different ways, right? So what do these photons do when they break free, right? Or when they leave the light source, right? So we turn on a light, there's these billions of photons coming out and they're colliding with electrons. Now they're not all colliding with electrons. Some are colliding with the nucleus of the atom. Some are missing and just passing right through, right? But right now we're just going to focus on what they do when they hit electrons. Well, two things can happen, right? But they have to happen in a very specific order. The first thing that has to happen when they collide with an electron is they break it free, right? So the, the electron is knocked out of orbit, right? So some of the energy that the photon has goes into just breaking the electron free, right? And there's a minimum amount of energy to cause this, right? We saw the higher wavelengths, the orange and reds, didn't matter. The photons didn't have enough energy just to break it free. So nothing else mattered. They simply didn't break free. They're done, right? This, 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 this photoelectric effect didn't happen, right? But this minimum amount of energy is what we call the work function. The work function is the energy required to break an electron free from its orbit, right? So that's the first thing that happened. If the electron breaks free and there's still more energy left, then that energy goes into kinetic energy, right? That determines the speed that the electron is traveling after it breaks free, right? Because it doesn't change the mass of the electron and we know the equation for kinetic energy. So we'll use it again in this section at some point, right? So these two things could possibly happen, or none of them happen, or there's just enough to break it free, but it doesn't go anywhere, and then it gets pulled back into an atom again, right? So there's kind of some variations, but these are the things that we're looking at. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to go back to this picture, right? Very easy when we shine light to vary the intensity and therefore see how many electrons are breaking free because as I change the intensity up top, 
I could read the current down below, and the current is directly related to the number of electrons you know, moving by per second, right? So it's very easy to see a relationship between intensity and current when we're at a good wavelength, when we're, when we're at a wavelength that releases high energy photons, right? When we go to a higher one, again, I know I'm kind of repeating myself, right? As we change the intensity, we see no electrons are breaking through. But the other thing is, too, is there's a battery down here in this setup. And the battery tells us something very important. We know that these are the two things that could happen. Electrons break free, and then when they break free, they're gonna have a certain amount of kinetic energy. And both of these values are based on how much energy the photon gave the electron. So the second part is, is this stop and voltage. There's a battery down below. And what we see is as the electrons break free, right? If we move this in one direction, well, not much happens, right? These electrons keep on cruising. But if we start adjusting this voltage in the other direction, we're making this plate more negative. And it means electrons really don't want to go there. And we keep adjusting this voltage until all the current flow stops, right? Now, if I keep making it more negative, this current flow is still going to be zero. But I'm trying to find that value that just stops the electrons from flowing. So we see they break free. They head that way, but they don't quite get there, right? So we don't have electrons flowing through this this wire if you will and the stopping voltage becomes very important because it's the minimum voltage as need to stop all current flow stop and voltage that makes sense but we could use that to determine the kinetic energy again two things happen when a photon hits an electron one it breaks it free and the second thing is it gives kinetic energy so if i know the energy per charge voltage is defined as the energy per charge and i know the charge of an electron right I can figure out how much energy each electron had, which is useful, right? I can figure out its kinetic energy. Which brings us to our equation for the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is the photon energy equals the work function, the energy that's required to break the electron free, plus the kinetic energy. So this is our start to it. Hopefully this experiment makes sense. Hopefully this equation makes sense. And then in the next one, we're going to do some examples. Um, and we're going to look at how we use this stop and voltage to determine the kinetic energy, um, how we determine the work function, and so on and so forth. Right. So we'll work our way through um, this equation.